Okay, so thank you. welcome to the Technology Enhanced Learning Community of Practice, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is our second meeting for the year, and I made the joke to Robert that apparently the theme for 2021 is interviewing guys called Michael, because I was the interviewee for the first one. Yeah. Uh, Michael, thank you, is our interviewee for the second one. So we will see if we can keep that going for the rest of the year. 2021 will be the year of Michael's. But as I said, our special guest for today is Professor Michael Sankey, who was Director of Learning Transformation, I think, at Griffith Uni up until fairly recently, and is now Director of Learning Futures up at Charles Darwin University with our former yeah. Vice Chancellor, Scott Bowman. And your previous Provost, uh, Hillary, Hillary as well. Hillary Winchester, that's yeah. right. <laughs> so, this is a little bit of blah, blah about what the telcop is. I'm not going to read it to you um, and you can, you can read it yourself or if you'd like, go back to the recording and pause on the slide. Uh, this stuff is also on the staff net, but it just gives you a bit of an idea of what we're trying to achieve with the technology enhanced learning community of practice, just so you know what we're all about. This telcop uh, ha has existed for a couple of years, but was formerly the virtual and augmented and mixed reality community of practice and the educational technology and innovation community of practice. And we realized at some point that we were all inviting each other to all of our meetings and that it kind of made more sense for us to merge those together. And so if you're coming along to this and kind of going, oh, I used to be part of the VAM COP or the ETI COP, that's why we, we combine them together. But I'll probably stop saying that soon because it's been about two years, I think, since we did that. So, uh, so I think the COP is on, is on its own now. People that you'll see today, um, first and foremost, me. I think most of the people in the room know me already, but if you don't, um, there's a little blah, blah about me. That's Michael's official bio from somewhere or other. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to, you can call me Professor Tech, but you don't have to, don't feel obligated. I was going to put Professor Tech up there. Um, I do have him as a pillow behind me if you look really, really closely, right? So, you know, you can do that, but you don't have to. But uh, that's my super, secret superhero alias is Professor Tech, especially with all the kids. Uh, and my other secret shame is that I am a bit of a coffee snob. And so I tend to uh, tend to spend a lot of time thinking about coffee and espresso and how to make the perfect, uh, perfect, perfect, the perfect coffee shot is what I wrote on the slide. I love the way that sounded. So uh, that's a little bit about me, but I think most of you know me that I mean, the, the, the most important thing is, is that um, I'm, I'm a professor here at CQU or associate professor here at CQU in technology. And that's why I'm involved. The other person you should get to know is Robert. Uh, and Robert has a doctorate in educational psychology, currently a lecturer at CQ University. He does a lot of work in English and literacy and numeracy. And uh, previously, uh, for many, many years, was a professor, associate professor in the States running a thing called the Saturday Academy. But let's be honest, that's not the stuff you want to know. You want to know his secret shame. And his secret shame is that he, uh, he spends far too much time doing physical exercise compared to me. He, he rides his, his bike around Bundaberg um, and also has started taking up running recently as well, just to really shame me that I don't do enough physical exercise. Uh, and he's also a closet poker player or has been in the past a closet poker player. So at some point, ask Robert what the difference is between a pocket pair of sevens versus a gunshot straight <coughs> and he will probably be able to tell you the difference. I can see him nodding his head. Okay, last but not least, uh, the most important person. Oh, that didn't happen, did it? Let's go backwards. <laughs> Michael Sankey. And Michael Sankey is our guest today. And uh, there is his official bio, Director of Learning Futures and Lead Education Architect at Charles Dar University, Darwin University specialist in e-learning pedagogy, technology enhanced learning, multimodal design, digital visual, visual and multi-literacies, worked in higher ed for 30 years. And I don't know Michael's secret shame, you know, a coffee guy or a runner, or I'm not entirely sure, but maybe over <laughs> the, uh, of the interview, we might find out. What Some in Instagram addict. Oh uh, yes, social media addict. Well, no, that's it. Yeah, that's one of my bullets actually for you in the interview. So yeah, 
<laughs> and uh, if you want to know more about Michael, obviously, if you Google him, you'll find out lots. But he also owns michaelsankey.com. So you can find out some details about Michael there as well. And this is usually where I put a silly photo. Uh, but Michael has been very good at sort of cleaning out all the silly photos. <laughs> yeah, I could find in terms of silly photos of Michael Sankey is that one there, which is, is Michael seriously teaching something serious to somebody photo. Uh, <laughs> but he doesn't know it, but I actually took a photo of him where he was at the virtual uh, scholarship conference last year on my mm. computer. And so there's my version of Michael seriously presenting, uh, which is not really a silly photo, just probably a bad, bad time shot, Michael, but I love it. <laughs> You know, that it contrasted with the one on the left. Yes. Okay. So. <laughs> if I got the same shirt on. That's, oh, do you really? I don't know. It looks like I might have. Yes, you do. That's your presenting shirt. That must be my presenting shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different one today. Ah, uh, yes, yes. That's fortunately, it. Fortunately, fortunately. <laughs> that's, that's it for me for PowerPoint slides, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to stop the sharing and turn off the slides. And I'm going to start by asking Michael a softball question to start us off. And as I said to you, ladies and gents, as we go along, if you have any questions, please type some stuff into the chat and Robert is going to keep on, keep on top of all of that stuff for us. But I'm going to start with a real softball, softball question for Michael, which is tell us a little bit about your career to date and how you ended up where you are now in, in apparently the Northern Territory, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I, I started in higher education in the media unit at University of Southern Queensland. So where I was the senior photographer. Uh, so I'd been a photographer for a number of years prior to that uh, down in Geelong in Victoria, where I was uh, a photojournalist uh, working um, uh, for the Geelong Advertiser newspaper and some other entities as well. Uh, but came up to Queensland and got the job at uh, USQ as a photographer, senior photographer. And while I was there, thought there's got to be more to life than just doing photography for a you know, living. You know, I, can, I can do that and then do weddings and things like that. But in the end, uh, it's got to be more to life than that. So I thought, oh, while I'm at USQ, I'll do some more study. So ended up, uh, well, I, I upgraded to, uh, to my uh, Bachelor of Creative Arts and did an honours year, then got into, while I was doing that, I found uh, I was really enjoying the education side of things. So went on and did a Master of Education uh, dealing with online and distance learning. And uh, you might uh, know people like Shirley Ruschel and Glenn Possel and people like that. Uh, I was studying with them and uh, working with them and, and Jackie McDonald and things. And um, from there, I, I was really cheeky and went to my then boss, Alan Smith, who had, did, had uh, for some of you at CQ, you might remember Alan Smith, was up there for a while. Uh, I said to him, look, I've got my master's of uh, education now, so I think you should give me an instructional design job. And uh, he thought about it for a minute, said, oh, look, I've got a, I've got a job on the, uh, which is vacant at the moment. And, uh, you know, I'll, well, I'll give you a six month run. I'll give you a six month run at it. So he, he put me in the position by that, by, by the time I was six months into it, I'd kind of learnt the ropes and I was able to transition to a, a full-time academic level B position as a instructional designer. Uh, from there, it's kind of ballooned out. I then did my Doctor of Education through QT and really started to focus in on uh, open distance learning as a, um, as a specialty field. Uh, and I think from there, really, it was a matter of uh, became an academic developer, then became a, 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 a um, uh, manager, uh, of learning designers, then a you know, director of a department, and it kind of blossomed from there. So it just kind of kept uh, the momentum kept going, and it just was a lovely thing to be involved in. Then, of course, got involved in the work of ACODE, the Australasian Council of Open Distance E Learning. Uh, I was on their executive committee for a number of years, then became uh, vice president and uh, currently president of the uh, Australasian Council ACODE. And uh, uh, CQU, of course, hosted our uh, ACODE meeting a few months back. Uh, thanks with and big thanks to Katie uh, for having uh, being involved in that as well. So, look, we've we've really enjoyed this exciting time. So, I started teaching online uh, in Blackboard Four 
in uh, 2001. I was teaching web design and publishing. So I did that as well as being an instructional designer. So I taught that for a number of years uh, in the early days where you, you know, created things in HTML and put them up online. Uh, and then <laughs> the early days of Dreamweaver and things like that, teaching students, uh, potentially uh, pr primarily postgrad students, how to develop uh, meaningful uh, online sites and the, the, the whole notion of uh, coherent uh, navigation and uh, where to put things on a page and all that kind of thing. So that was a, a great uh, time of, particularly back in those days when learning management systems were fairly, fairly rudimentary uh, to then now uh, working with tools that are so much more um, sophisticated. It's been a lovely journey kind of following that through and, and trying to transition some of the understandings you had back then, kind of keeping, trying to keep that, keep ahead of those kind of trends. Because uh, it's very easy to, to, to have had success in online learning for a number of years and then stick in that mode without actually moving forward with the newer technologies that are coming through. So it's really important. You don't just say, well, it's worked this way for years. Let's, I'm just going to, it works. Why, why would I want to change it? It's actually that, that is not moving us forward. We need to be able to move ourselves forward with the newer technologies that, you know, we're, we're all starting to, you know, initially get uncomfortable with, but then we become comfortable and then we become comfortable again, stay comfortable, and then this next thing comes along. And so it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's that way in the academic career as well. You need to keep pushing those boundaries uh, in your publications and things like that. And it's been a joy to be involved in that. Awesome, awesome. That's, that's a great, I love that summary. Um, can I just ask everyone to check that their microphones are muted? Uh, uh, Stephanie, I think we can hear you. In the background, awesome, thank you. And um, Sudash, maybe Sudash needs to mute his microphone too. There you go. Yeah. Michael's keeping an I'm eye. I'm under this. I'm under this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you. So I, I noticed that uh, in your titles over the last couple of years, and, and I've got a question to ask you about being an instructional designer as we get mm. along as well. But um, before we get there, I noticed in your last couple of titles, it's been, you know, Director Learning Transformation, Director Learning Futures or Education Architect. I love education. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why do you think transformation, you kind of touched on it a little bit already when you said that people go online and then they stop right yeah. you know, um why do you think transformation is is so important or, or looking towards the future in this new role is, is so important to what you do well i think fundamentally uh industry doesn't stop and so we're we uh, we have this sense it, it more so now than ever i mean the the, the rate of change within industry is, is is phenomenal the 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 types of technologies they're using the way in which i mean if you just take the uh, manufacturing sector, for example, and the way in which now you can, you don't have to leave your home to purchase clothes or whatever it is. Uh, it, and then the sophistication of the online sites that are involved, the AI that sits behind those sites that, you know, will tell you, you really want this piece of clothing and things like that. Uh, they're, they're, these are technologies that are out there and people are living with them every day. Uh, and so as we, as educators, uh, prepare our students for the workforce, we need to be walking the talk with them along the way. And so it's, it's not a, a case of, we've got a learning management system, here's the lecture, here's the, okay, we've got our quiz, we've got our assignment, we've got our exam or bigger assignment, uh, and that's the way we're gonna deal with education. Uh, that, is, that has been a true, a, a true and tried method for many decades, except now we're moving into a place where uh, those true and tried things are being broken. And that's what the, the whole, um, you know, the next generation of, of uh, you know, the, the fourth generation, I can't remember, I've just lost the title at the moment, but uh, the, the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution comes, it's, it breaks things. Industrial revolutions break things. And as they break things, we need to, we need to be walking with those newer things that are going to lead the way. Now that, means sometimes we're using tools that don't work as well as they could and we make mistakes uh, but the, the whole premise of that is that we're we're pushing the boundaries with newer newer forms of uh, technologies newer forms of education as we start moving into more collaborative forms of of working 
as people do in the workplace. And so it's, it's, we've got that kind of future focus happening of always working with and aiming towards uh, uh, where that industry is going, where the workforce is going, but also trying to lead the way in that. So it's not just the fact that we're following, we actually need to be walking hands in hands, hand in hand forward with industry. So I told you the first one was a softball question. I think this one's a trickier question then. So look at <laughs> that. I mean, you must have lots of people come to you and say to you, oh, you're director of learning futures, Michael, you know, or transformation. Here's this awesome piece of technology. I've just done this deal with this organization, you know, maybe people like Scott Bowman, for example, say, hey, we bought all this awesome tech, you know, and you, you, would have to balance, I think, uh, that idea of, of pushing forward, which you just talked about, with the idea that, that there is value in the pedagogy. And I know you do that. I know you're very, very much about pedagogy before technology and, and pedagogy mm. for first. So how do you balance the future focus with the pedagogy focus? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that is so important. You're so right, Michael. It's uh, the, the pedagogy... Uh, yeah. So, there's no the, the word pedagogy is really prob problematic. The word prob pedagogy is problematic in itself, in the sense that there's no one pedagogy now, and so we we are moving through, and there are so many odgies. Uh, so, you know, pedagogy, andragogy, hudagogy, you know, all these odgies that uh, when we look at it, we see that there's a as a way that we can fit ourselves into that. We can feel comfortable within a suite of different ways of, of teaching and learning. Um, as we start to, in a sense, have that meta understanding of the way we, we teach, that gives us a sense of, of the types of technologies that might, we can start then looking at the types of technologies that we can augment our philosophies with. And so, you know, there's, there's the odgies and the isms. So you've got your, you know, your constructivism, your, your socio-constructivisms, your uh, connectivisms and things like that. As we put those concepts together in our head and we start to learn that, that there are more ways to teach than the ways we, were, we learned and that there are newer ways or different ways in which we can engage students other than lectures, uh, tutorials, quizzes, assignments, exams. So as we start to understand that there are other ways in which other people are doing things, we start to see that there are tools that they are using and that industry are using that we can start to introduce into our, our own teaching moving forwards. Now, that, you're right, I get hit every, almost every day with people saying, you need to be using this technology. You need to be investigating this technology. Fundamentally, a lot of those technologies do very similar things, or well, there are clusters of things. And so here's this new, uh, uh, this new tool that allows students to interface with each other. And here's this new tool for video production. Here's this new tool. They, they fall into clusters. The thing that we need to do at that point is step back and say, well, what, what are the approaches I'm going to use to teaching? Do I want to be able to use uh, video cap? Do I want to capture my lecture for two hours? Or do I want to capture 10 minute snippets of and have that, have that dotted throughout a, a learning module with, with more interaction built around that? And why do you do that? So why do I want to then say, okay, am I trying to replicate a face-to-face -face scenario? Or am I trying to create a work ready graduate whereby they are starting to be far more productive as a, as a basic premise, as opposed to sitting there and learning. So as we start to think in terms of a work ready graduate, we, we start to think in terms of how we prepare the students to be work ready. That means that they are being productive from, from when they start. So they're not just producing an assignment, but they're being productive in the sense of uh, being able to add to knowledge, add to the, the industry that they're moving towards. 
and uh, whether that be agricultural engineering or something like that, where they can start to investigate and bring into the learning scenario those things that they would do within a work within a work situation. So what we're seeing emerging is far more collaborative tools in learning and teaching. So we're starting to see the rise of productivity tools. So those things like Microsoft Teams, Slack, tools like that that are allowing students to work together, uh, but not in the traditional group within a learning management system where they're kind of constrained. There's these newer tools like Teams and Slack allow for much greater uh, uh, collaboration and um, much more socially focused learning than what we've had in the past. And so if we can then bolt things onto the side of those that help with us scaffolding information for students, that provides us uh, kind of the best of both worlds. So here's the here's mimicking in the sense of the, the workforce moving forward. Uh, and then let's augment that with you know, whether it be an e-portfolio, whether it be a, uh, um, uh, uh, a, a media repository and things like that. So it's, it's, it's how we are, and, and LinkedIn and, and things like that, how are we going to create a, a scenario whereby the students see themselves as professionals from day one of entering the university and moving through into realising that potential for themselves? Awesome. I love uh, when I whenever I listen to you, Michael, you do a really good job at sort of distilling things down and, and grouping things together and breaking things into <laughs> you know, groups. And and I was listening to you talk about the clusters. And I remembered that when we did the virtual scholarship conference, that one of the things you did is listen to Kate's opening keynote. And then the next day on Twitter, say, here's a model of some of the stuff that Kate talked about. In <laughs> opening keynote. And, that, and so I was just reminded of that. Um, and in a minute, I'll ask you about social media as well, if we get yeah. time. But before that, Robert has been fielding a few bits and bobs, I think, privately and he's got a question for you so i'm going to hand over to robert for a second mm. yeah um you talk about different pedagogies dealing with all these different new learning isms um I, i'm we're kind of interested as cqu being a good percentage of distance and digital education that now you're moving to charles darwin which is also uh, distant and has a lot of what are you predicting will be some of your pedagogy changes moving to an institution similar to ours mm. what are you thinking you'll practice try do mm. yeah uh, so one of the things uh, that are very so I, so I was at usq as well which is of course uh, 75 percent distant students so that was there for 26 years so uh fairly got a fairly good grounding in distance and online learning so uh at CQU, uh, it's really interesting because they are very so similar in terms of the demographic and the and the the notion of vet and higher education. Um, it's it's I, I see some of the challenges moving forward for us are that articulation processes so that vet students don't see themselves as second class students, that they are actually part of a continuum of students, and that we are using the systems that we have to help uh, both VET and HE students work together more, uh, forming clusters uh, amongst themselves around disciplines and things like that. So I really see that and uh, just preempting the thought that this notion of social media and things like that, that Michael alluded to, that there is a, a real place for this notion of social within higher education around discipline rather than around course or unit. It's around the, the creation of knowledge uh, and the and like joining like uh, students uh, doing engineering at a at a vet level mixing with students who are doing engineering at uh, higher education level. Now, obviously, there are uh, differences in terms of enrolment patterns and all that kind of thing. So, whatever we do actually has to transcend that enrolment pattern, and so it means using tools that allow us to. Uh, form those interest groups around particular thing, whether it be robotic engineering, whether it be, you know, and so there's an interest group for robotic engineering. There might be an interest group for electrical engineering, uh, both across VET and higher education that allows the students to feel as though they're part of a discipline, uh, that they're part of a, 
uh, 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 a career path that might finish at, the, at VET, but might also continue through to higher education and things like that. So the more of our VET students are aligned with our education students and can feel as though they're part of that learning journey, it's about giving them that sense that they're on a journey and that they're actually moving towards a profession and that they're moving forward with others of like mind. Now, what roles, well, there are things like micro-credentials come into that. There are things like uh, uh, the e-portfolio, as I mentioned before, there are the, um, the getting, and you know, um, similar to CQU, there are a number of our students already in work, for example, and how we draw what they're doing in work, you know, within, within privacy regulations, of course, how they draw in and, uh, and, and bring that into the mix for our students. Yeah, um, Joe Dargish and I had a HEP, branded, a HEP funded project and we worked on developing a site where students would get that transfer and that community with each other. Yeah. They would also get like just simple things that they help that transfer of the differences between VET goals and uni goals. Yeah, yeah. yeah we developed that. Um, Ron John has a question for you. He says that um, he's added some teams to Moodle but he has not had access in students, uh, students accessing it yet. Do you have any tips for him on getting students to access it better? Mm. So one of the tips is that students will go there if there's something there to go for. They're not gonna go there just to feel good about being there. <laughs> so uh, as, as I, I'm not gonna go to LinkedIn, I'm not gonna go to Twitter, I'm not gonna go to you know, other sites if I don't feel there's gonna be something there for me. And so there's some teasers you need to do to get students into those things. So you might put a topic in there that's related to uh, you know, an assessment or something like that, get them in there at that level. And so they can start then where, where I'm gonna share the links that are gonna help you with this assessment item is in there not within the learning management system. So it's getting them into that space first, helping them feel comfortable in that space. Once they feel comfortable in that space, if it's, for example, in Teams, uh, which has a far more social media type feel to it, um, we, uh, I, there's, there's no point taking me into discussion forums in Moodle anymore. I mean, discussion forums are you know, so passe now. Who in the workforce uses a discussion forum? If I'm going to go out and work in an accounting firm or an agribusiness group, they're not going to be using discussion forums. They're going to be using things like Skype, uh, um, Slack or Microsoft Teams. That's where you want the students interacting with each other. You don't want them interacting in a discussion forum. Uh, so get them into that space, get them, you know, working with their memes and their, and their GIFs and their things like that. So they actually, because that's what they do out in the real world. They use these, you know, they have different ways of communicating. It's not simply a matter of text. It could be audio, it could be, it's, it's a whole range of things we need to be working with. And it means the lecturer has to do that too. You can't just say, here's that space, you go for it. You've actually got to be exemplar in the way you do it. You need to be uh, in there putting your memes up as well. You need to be putting up the your audio bits and pieces. It's, 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 it's helping them learn by, the lecturer doing, not by saying. That actually leads really well into a question I was going to ask you, and I'm actually getting some interesting insight. I, I've, I've called you prolific on social media in the past. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's a compliment or not, but certainly, I mean, in terms of looking on LinkedIn or looking on Twitter, um, I Michael Sankey seems to be everywhere all the time, which is awesome, right? I, I love it. Um, is is the reason you tend to do that uh, going? Is it is it what we call in the tech industry dog fooding, right? It's it's you as you just said, right? Practicing what you preach. Do you think that the industry as a whole, the learning and teaching industry, should share valuable insights? And so you do that. Is that? Uh, I'm starting to think that might be what you're kind of doing. Precisely, absolutely. I've got to eat my own dog food. Absolutely. There's no point me saying in a presentation that you know you should be using social media if I'm not prepared to use it myself. Absolutely, yeah, you've got to you've got to walk the talk and lead by example. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's that's good. I don't, you know, I, I, so that's my answer when people call me a media tart. Apparently, <laughs> just leading by example. Right? Hopefully, 
<laughs> hopefully, that hopefully the things I'm putting up are meaningful. Though, you know, <laughs> I like I like how you are. You're, and as I said earlier, you're much better than me. You put these great summaries of things. It's awesome. Uh, Robert's got a question from Tacitus. Well, it's sort of a question uh, from T uh, Imam. It says, "What up, Tacitus?" I can tell you. Huh? <laughs> it's Tacitus. Tacitus Imam. Ah. So they appreciate your different types of media bring into integration of learning, but um, he's wondering if you think that causes some extrinsic cognitive load with too many channels of delivery. Oh, absolutely. You have to be careful of that without doubt, uh, which is one of the reasons I kind of tend towards saying to most people when, when talking with people that you're not using more than three or four environments in any one unit or study, uh, because it really does, uh, uh, start to uh, it, so lecturer one has got you know, uh, might use the Moodle, might use Teams, might use some lecture recording, might use an ePortfolio. Lecturer two might use uh, Moodle. Uh, they might use Teams. They may or may not use Teams, but they go out and take you out to Facebook and things like that, and then they take you off to YouTube's and all kinds of things. There's students need to find that there are some commonalities across their courses and the units that they're studying. If there are too many differentials around the side, uh, it starts to get really confusing for them. So one, students need to know where their assessment, there needs to be, the assessment needs to be in that same place in every course or unit that you go into. So they know where that is. They need to know up front what tools you're gonna to be using. So the, the lecturer needs to be explicit in week one of that course, what tools they're going to be using and why they're using them. Give them a reason to engage with those tools. So if I'm going to use um, uh, ePortfolio, for example, why would I want to use ePortfolio? Is it because the discipline uses it? Is it because the, the, uh, the, you think it's a good idea the students have an ePortfolio? If I'm going to say to you, if I'm going to say to a student, uh, little Paula there, you're going to have to set yourself up in an ePortfolio. Well, Paul is quite rightly can say back to me, well, where's your e-portfolio? You, can you show me where your e-portfolio is? I'd like to be able to mimic what you do. Uh, well, if the lecturer hasn't got an e-portfolio, why on earth are they asking their students to have an e-portfolio? I mean, fair dinkum. <laughs> You've got to be able to walk those talks with those tools. Now, if the students see that there's a reason to use those tools and that they're being exemplified in the way they're being used, then then there's every reason why they should use those tools moving forward. So I would uh, suggest not too many tools, that there are some agreed tools of the institution, of course there are, uh, but that, that they become the, the core set of tools and that you might add some extra things on the side, particularly that would be used in industry uh, and particularly to create that, uh, at, that would generate uh, new ideas and things like that. Those, so, you know, uh, what would be some of those tools? It might be VoiceThread, it might be, so how many people in the workforce use VoiceThread? Well, not many, but it's a good tool. How many people use Padlet out in the workforce? Well, they put sticky notes on walls and things like that. So, yep, no, there's a case for using, uh, you know, Padlet or something like that to create and generate ideas amongst each other. So, look, it, it needs, uh, and that comes from a program perspective and as, as our teachers across first year and second year work together uh, and talk through the tools that they're using with their students. It's, you know, there needs to be that kind of common thread uh, that students don't get lost because I'm studying four courses at one time, unless you're using a block model of teaching, I'm sort of studying four courses at one time and all of a sudden I've got to be exposed to 20 different systems. That, that is not going to work for the students. So, you told us that you started life as an instructional designer, actually as a as a photographer, but then eventually as a as an instructional designer, and and yeah. that kind of links to what you're saying about choosing those tools really carefully and having a having something valuable in those tools. Um, mm. I was going to ask you about your transition from those instructional designers to being an academic transition mm. over to the dark side, as our colleague Bobby Harrabeld might say. Um, but maybe I'll ask you more broadly about uh, how you see everybody else, all of those other roles fitting into this overall digital transformation. So I see people like uh, Amy Croft, in the, for example, and she works in the library, you know, and there, there are other people here that are PhD students or, mm. you know, uh, student support staff. Mm -hmm. um, 
how how do you see all of that fitting together into this overall transformation that we've been talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, you'd know that uh, my mentor, my mentee last year was a learning designer from QT, Amanda Bellamy. And uh, she was a newbie to instructional design. And uh, in that mentor-mentee relationship, I kind of worked with Amanda to, and we did a little survey of learning designers across uh, the sector. And uh, we looked at, uh, and that was basically at the beginning of COVID, so it was kind of really, okay, this could be really useful now. Um, <laughs> the role of instructional designers within higher education. And so what we did, we had 90 something people, 90 something instructional designers across the sector. So be educational designer, learning designer, uh, blended learning designer, that kind of role. Uh, and there were a whole, every institution calls them different things. And there's a, yeah, but essentially there are those people who work with academic staff who support them in the uh, creation of learning environments and 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 advise them on the on the, the 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 consistency issues across learning and teaching. So what we find what we found is that the role and with other studies we'd investigated as part of that process is the role of the instructional designer learning designer has evolved quite substantially over the last twenty years. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going back twenty years when I started that process. At that point, it was very much work with the academic staff. Here's a template that you use. Uh, you've got to have your, uh, uh, you know, your schedule for the semester. You've got to have your assessment items. Here's your, here's your readings. Here's your modules, things like that. So the, to, it evolved, instructional design thing evolved out of this correspondence model, uh, essentially. Uh, and has now moved into now that so many more of us are using the online space, uh, that that correspondence model has devolved, and we're now having uh, all these discussions about the different pedagogies and things. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to re-rehearse that stuff. But the role of the instruction designer has, has been really uh, as a moderator of a lot of the stuff that happens in higher education now. So uh, a lot of academics tend now to rely on their educational designer to provide insights of what's happening around them so uh, they as as instructional designer works with four or five ten academics uh, there's that kind of meta cognitive process that happens across the, the relationships and so that instructional designer is playing a, a pivotal role in providing that institutional context for them uh, and this is particularly important when we come to sessional lectures and to first, you know, lecturers who are just starting in the in the in that, and they become they've become quite a pivotal part of every university. Of course, over the years, those academic roles have been devalued a bit, and now become professional roles in many cases. And we're seeing that, uh, but nevertheless, those professional roles are being seen as key to the consistency of uh, course and, and unit offerings across institutions. Alan raised a great point, right? That um, he's at one university said, well, you're not allowed to use Discord. And this concept of making sure we interact with our students in a way a unity lit grieves. Like I moving here from America, there isn't like a Facebook control in America. The first thing I learned is public school teachers are not allowed to have any links with their students on Facebook here. Yep. Yeah. And um, so, understanding that that technology has its its joys but your employment might have its limits <laughs> absolutely uh and there I mean, yeah, there are some good reasons why australian universities don't employ facebook in their teaching uh, one that students are going to be exposed to ads uh students are going to you know uh, have their data used in inappropriate ways necessarily but, you know potentially by facebook we're probably not as uh I think they're good things. Uh, personally, I don't see that Facebook wasn't designed for education. It was designed for social interaction amongst friends, and that's fine. You do that out there. Absolutely, you go for it. You have a little, you have a little tutorial group yourselves out there in Facebook if you want to. But the university's got this tool that it uses for that, and if it can mimic in some way that same type of look and feel, 
fantastic. The students will be far more comfortable going there, knowing that the data is secure, knowing that there is a, a safe place in which they can work. Now, we used to call that the walled garden uh, in, in the, in the, in back in the day where we had the learning management system. At, those, at that point, we only had learning management systems to work with in discussion forums, and we called that the walled garden. Nowadays, uh, that, that, that notion of that walled garden is, is, has broken down to some degree. Some, it still exists in some cases, but there's this notion that there's this kind of impervious wall, this, this wall that allows uh, traffic backwards and forwards. And it's as we start to get into the use of LTIs, learning technology interoperabilities in, in terms of XAPIs that allow for the transfer of data across systems, it has become so much more seamless how we can start to, one, uh, help our students have those safe spaces, but also, two, how we can use the data to help us understand the student behaviours and things like that. We don't want to send students off to, I don't want to send students off to Facebook and have no idea what's happening out there, how they're interacting. I would rather them work within Microsoft Teams, for example, and have, have some vision of how they're interacting with their other students. So not so we can police them, but so we can actually start to intervene if we see that students aren't engaging. So it's using the learning analytics behind the BI business intelligence of our systems to be able to proactively help our students by the use of AI in that to for the for the bot to tell us that our, you know our little Johnny's not engaging terribly well at the moment. So uh, as we start to uh, mature in these areas and as you know our Azure platforms and uh, things start if we start to purposefully use that data uh, we can actually uh, students start to see that there is a benefit to using those systems because they are well they're getting more engaged in their study because the lecturers being able to proactively intervene where, where necessary. Awesome. I love how everything you do, Michael, always comes back to the education and, and, and whether we pedagogy or andragogy or whatever, I mean, ultimately you're sort of saying if these things work for education, that's what you're, what you're really <laughs> arguing. I wanted to take a little bit of a left turn because I know we've only got about 10 minutes left. Um, and I wanted to just briefly, you got in an awesome plug there for the Ask a Light Community Mentoring Program. So, so thank you for that. And ladies and gentlemen, if you know, want to know about the Ask a Light Community Mentoring Program, I run the Ask a Light Community Mentoring Program. So send me an email. <laughs> and I'll <laughs> hook you up with a mentee or set you up as a mentor. So thank you for that, Michael. But in return, I wanted to ask you a little bit about a code and what a code does and the first interaction i had with a code is when they gave me this awesome coaster a couple <laughs> of years ago and it was probably from i probably got it from you at a booth or something michael i didn't even know who you were at the time but um but a code and Ascalite, i think we work relatively well together and Ascalite is is more i think focused on individual members but a code in my experience is focused a little bit more on those some of those bigger picture ideas you're obviously president of a code this year and have been for for the last few years why are you involved with a code and what do you think it brings to our our industry of technology enhanced learning hmm. so a code is a council not an association so that's a, a, a clear differentiation there. ACODE is made up of representatives of a university, not individuals. So of course they're individuals, but they their, their role is to represent their institution, not to represent themselves. So I represent, in this case, CDU. I did represent Griffith. I did represent you know, Western Sydney when I was there. So I am there to uh, work with my fellow members of institutions uh, to advance our, to advance technology hence learning. So you might be aware that we produced a white paper around uh, the, the exam invigilation softwares uh, last year. And so what we did is we work with our members to understand what each institution is doing with the exam invigilation softwares. Uh, and then we produce a white paper around that so that everybody within the sector knows what what's happening within the sector. So how many people are using invigilation softwares? How many people are doing it themselves? How many people have moved away from exams to uh, you know, more open book uh, uh, assessments? And so we try and provide a sector view for the sector uh, based on what institutions are doing, uh, whether it be micro credentials, whether it be lecture capture, whether it be e portfolio, we've produced white papers around all these different things so that 
it provides guidance to the sector. And of course, I just get a buzz out of that. <laughs> Awesome. Who's our who's our A code rep? It would probably be Madam Professor Kate Haynes, I would imagine yeah. at this point. Yeah, me and Nadine. You and Nadine. Nadine. Awesome. Nadine online at the moment? Um, I don't think so. I think she's got no. another meeting today, but um, yeah, yeah. And I also know that our colleague Cherie Roy has had a lot to do with A code as well, and Michael uh yeah. has has worked with Cherie as well. So uh, we've got a few minutes left, Michael. Here's my, my, last, my last question, unless Robert has some sneaky questions or anybody else. <laughs> there is still an opportunity, ladies and gents. If you've got any questions, send them to Robert or type them in the chat, uh, or even just put up your hand. We'll let you open your microphone and talk as well. Uh, but my last question for you, Michael, is imagine you could wave a magic wand and you could change one thing about techno technology and education tomorrow. Big picture, you know, time, money, no object. The one thing you could change about technology enhanced learning or technology in education, what would it be? What would you love to see change? I think what I'd love to see is the ability for students to, it's not just higher education, so it's, it's the way in which we interface with industry. So at this point, it's, reasonably difficult to interface with industry. Uh, I mean, it's happening better now in Microsoft Teams and things like that. But uh, traditionally, through a learning management system, it's really hard to get people, you know, it's such a painstaking activity to get somebody from uh, KPMG into your learning management system. So I think as we've moved more towards these collaborative forms of, of softwares that are, that are used in industry, it's become a lot easier to do that. I think there's uh, a lot more scope for uh, industry to be involved in higher education to ensure that we're in partnership moving forward, not just in name, but actually in practice too. And so that way industry assures that they are going to get graduates that they need, uh, but also that the university is producing the graduates they need, but that most fundamentally, the students are getting the information and the experiences that they need to be productive from day one of when they get into industry. So I think there's some real work and that, you know, to some degree it involves micro credentials, it involves more interoperability, uh, means more work integrated learning, it means more virtual work integrated learning, uh, means more AR, VR, it's, it's a whole range of more artificial intelligence. So it's, it's as we evolve these processes to make it possible uh, for us to be more engaged, uh, not just uh, with our students, but also with those people that those students will be interfacing with in the future. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, spoken like a true technology person. I, I agree. There's this gap, isn't there? And, and we send the students in, they say, why didn't you teach them this thing? And it's like, because we didn't, let's, all the technology just moves so quickly that we, yeah, we, we have trouble keeping up. So how can we connect with industry in a way that means that we give them those job ready graduates in a yeah. world where things are just moving so 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 fast I, yeah. I and, and it's part of part of that is making room within the the life of a lecturer to be able to engage more with industry themselves mm. i mean if i did my if i did my accounting study 30 years ago and i've been teaching accounting for 30 years and i have had very little engagement with the accounting profession and where it's going with the types of softwares they use and things like that. It's, it's difficult without having that, uh, that current information. It's about our academics keeping current in those things and giving them the opportunity within their, within their work life to be able to keep current. Mm, sounds good to me. I wish my dean was here. Michael, Michael thank you. <laughs> I, I said... <laughs> yes, that's right. I should get more time to play with technology. It's three days in VR, you know. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, I think that's pretty good. If there's any last minute burning questions, ladies and gentlemen, we do have may have time for one sneaky one more. Otherwise, unless Dr. Vanderberg has any questions, um, I think uh, we're starting. We just had a question posted. Oh, awesome. Are online HE providers right when they say their learning engagement is low because their online students have a different type of engagement? In other words, prefer engaging with tutors than classmates. 
uh, is it true? Well, if, if <laughs> yes, it is true if the, uh, the, the unit or course is not structured in such a way that would preference the use of peer learning. Uh, so we've been, I've been, when I was at Griffith, you know, not long ago now, uh, but uh, we were really moving forward in tools that were peer focused. So uh, things like the use of uh, uh, feedback fruits, uh, the use of um, uh, peer assessments, the use of um, uh, the use of Microsoft Teams and things like that. So it's those, if we start to engage, if, if, if I preference peer learning and want my students to be peer learning, uh, I need to be as a lecturer engaging with the, with the technology. You cannot expect them to do that in a discussion forum. I just keep, you cannot expect a static, a fairly didactic tool like a discussion forum to engage students in peer learning. It just ain't gonna happen, not nowadays. They need to be using those technologies that allow for that uh, that seamless and and fun uh, interaction. Well, it's it's like anything historically, right? A group work for the sense of having people to talk to each other ends up people talking to each other. <laughs> group work with a structure and a format and a meaning and a purpose generates learning. Absolutely. So it's not going to be any different in a digital form that it is in a human form, right? Absolutely. And so if you're just saying, hey, go over here to use this because you want that in your portfolio that they use it, but you don't structure it in a way that enhances a, a system of learning with a goal <laughs> and a potential, you're gonna be stuck. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a learning objective in your course that says group work, own it, own it. Uh, actually enjoy it and, and try and flourish in that. Don't just say, oh no, I've got to do group work. Oh bugger, what am I gonna do now? Uh, <laughs> you got to own it and enjoy it. Don't lean on the technology, sounds like. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'm conscious of the time, ladies and gentlemen. There's a couple of other little comments um, in, the, in there, but I think they're mainly endorsement of some of the awesome things that we're saying. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind up and, uh, and say thank you so much to Professor Michael Sankey for, uh, for coming along we really appreciate it yes paul's got it right a virtual round of applause <laughs> either by clicking the button or by you know uh by pressing by clapping in front of the screen awesome thank you so much and enjoy the trip north michael uh, to the northern territory and dial in with us soon and let us know how the how the temperature is up in darwin and how things are going <laughs> And uh, whether it's Scott Bowman invites you over or not, you know. Yeah, that's right. Do I get to have dinner with Scott, baby? Hey, what do you sure. reckon? Yeah, I'm sure you. Would. <laughs> you would. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Michael, and All thank right. you for moderating. And thank you everybody else for attending. We'll see you at the next one. Cheers, guys. Thanks. <laughs>